So our final conversation is uh, today is with someone who leads the e-commerce for an industry giant, and she's here to share her insights into the inner workings of a large data-driven business. So Ji Sheng is uh, the vice president and global head of digital commerce at Mondelez. Uh, my household spends a lot of money on Oreos, and I'm, you know I'm sure my son's going to be very happy about it that I was talking to her today. So to start off with, uh, please tell us about your role uh, at the company, your background, and what you're currently responsible for. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so first of all, very excited to be here, and uh, thank you for having me, uh, Bloomberg. Um, my role is, as I mentioned, you know, I lead the global e-commerce. Um, at Mondelez, yes, we are the Oreo maker <laughs> and also Reese Cracker and the Cadbury chocolate, a lot of amazing, you know, uh, iconic brands around the world. Uh, so in my current role, I lead uh, e-commerce at a global scale, you know, um, and but maybe I can share a little bit about my background. I spent over 20 years in uh, digital marketing and e-commerce in various CBG companies, including like Hershey, Campbell Soup, they're not a lot of food company, right? But also Philips North America as well. And uh, in my roles, you know, uh, I think I've witnessed and also actively contribute, uh, contributed to the remarkable evolution of digital media and the e-commerce in business. But at the core of that evolution, it is really the data. You know, the data, the, the ever-growing significance of data that drive uh, decisions in the business world. So in my country, as I lead e-commerce business, you know, I am also uh, deeply involved in integrating data analytics in every aspect of e-commerce business. So happy to be here again, you know, to share some perspective of how we use data in our CBG world, the consumer goods world. Yeah. That's great. So you're back in Hershey's also. So collectively, it's responsible for a lot of my weight gain. Um, so, you know, how are, you know, things different in the U.S. versus some other parts of the, the world when it comes to um, these businesses, you know? For e-commerce for specifically. E yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. I think to, to share that maybe a little bit uh, uh, first, you know, uh, the, the different models of e-commerce, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually very vastly different as well. You know, for example, when we talk about e-commerce, you know, think about, we always think about Amazon, right? You order something, get shipped to your home in one day delivery, or that, but it's a sh home shipment. It needed to be shelf life stable, shipping friendly. So that is one fulfillment model, home shipment. Then in the food space, it became much more complicated because it's perishable. You know, how can you ship like uh, ice cream? Uh, maybe yeah, the, the one thing they delivered in the last couple of years is called last mile delivery. So you order something, get it in 15 minutes. So that is another model, that's delivered to your home. Or you schedule appointment to get a grocery delivered to your home via Instacart in US, for example, right? But the most common one, which actually invented in Europe, not US, is called a click and collect. You order online, pick up in the store, which is a majority of e-commerce business. So uh, answer to your question, in US now, the click and collect is a very mature model now. If you go to Walmart, you go to you know, um, Target, you do have the click and collect choice. You, know, you, you still need to pick up yourself, but you, you can order and someone pack it for you then the Amazon one, then the Instacart one I, I mentioned. But you go to Europe or you go to Australia, the whole model is pretty much click and collect because those markets dominated by, you know, omni, we call the omni-channel customer or retailer. You know, think about if, I don't know if anyone comes uh, from Australia, like the two dominant retailers over there is Woolworths and Coles. So, 99% of the business is done in a click and collect mo model, right? Wow. Yeah. I personally, I, I grew up in China, uh, so I spent the last more than 20 years in U.S. Now, China is very dynamic e-com market, right? And uh, some of this um, e-commerce model is actually now started to invent it in China, like social commerce, TikTok in China. It's a, it's a lot, the live streaming, the um, the social commerce is loud and live over there. You know, a couple of years ago, we say it's Alibaba, Tmall, or JD.com. Those are dominant 80% business happening in those two platforms. 
they are losing traffic to to a platform like TikTok, which is Douyin in Chinese, right? Or the live streaming. <laughs> so it's vastly different. And if you go to India, it's, you know, so it's also another different model. It's a lot of last mile delivery. If you go to Latin America, Brazil, you know, it's also last mile, but also digitizing the traditional trades through different platforms. So it's a very dynamic space, and that's what gets me very excited to work on this space. You got to learn everything, uh, something new every day, basically. It's truly fascinating. Yeah. Do you have any thesis of why such a big disparity between these regions as you? Any, any, anything you can give us an insight on? Yeah, I think uh, uh, three things. You know, one is, I mentioned, is the retailer dynamics are very different uh, you know, in, in France or UK. You, know, you, have, you have those very multi-channel, omni-channel retailers who dominate space. So that's why you know, all, uh, the click and collect is so live over there. Um, and the, the shopper behavior is another thing, right? Shopper behavior is the consumers who are using, like Chinese consumers, for example, they are very into e-commerce buying, you know? Uh, so e-commerce penetration in China is the highest around the world. That's, a, that's another thing. Um, but so shopper is another area. So retailer is one. And then technology or infrastructure maturity, you know? Some of the markets have more established uh, uh, like fulfillment uh, uh, model in, uh, to enable the e-commerce. So those are kind of the three factors, retailers, readiness, shopper behavior, as, as well as uh, infrastructure or technology. Yeah. Now let's jump to data because that's an area where, <laughs> I, you know, we've seen so much of, uh, I say, change over the last several years. Yeah. How do you, you know, how's data being used in the world of CPG to mm. drive business decisions? Yeah. For sure. I, I think, first of all, data in CPG companies play a pivotal role in almost every aspect of business. But maybe I can share four key areas how CPGs use data. The first one is marketing, right? So we do read a lot of tons of data about our shoppers because we need to understand the shopper mission, the purchase pattern, and also the shopper behavior, right? So this way, can those, those insights feed into uh, tailor the marketing campaigns or optimize the pricing strategy and also operation as well. So that's marketing. The other area related is uh, new product development, right? So because a CPG company, we need to understand our consumer, what they want. So this market trend and the consumer needs ever evolving consumer demand is so important for us to know and we use, we read a lot of data for that. and. The, because I lead e-commerce, part of uh, my team's um, job is also managing the Amazon business. My team spend tons of, uh, a lot of time in analyzing the Amazon search data, for example, because it's such a rich perspective. You use those data, understand what people are looking for on Amazon.com, and what are some of the new trends people uh, you know, are actually expecting or looking for products like uh, health and wellness, for example, on Amazon to understand the new trends of snacking. And all these data help us to have a grasp idea about how, uh, you know, the consumer view so we can share with our R&D team for innovation, right? Uh, and the third space I would say is operation. So data uh, play a very extensive role in supply chain optimization. So we read sales data, weather patterns, and uh, logistic information. All this data helps us to manage inventory much more efficiently, right? And this data also helps us minimize whether it's overstock or out of stock situation. So we always keep the, the, uh, the level of the inventory to at the optimal level to meet the shopper needs. And lastly, in my own world, the e-commerce, we use a lot of data uh, to provide a more uh, pleasant shopping experience, you know, from the personalized uh, uh, website content all the way to recommended products. So all this uh, helping to provide a more seamless shopping uh, journey, basically. So those are kind of the four areas I can share. Apparently, every other areas are retail execution, use a lot of data, you know, and the technology for sure, right? So, but I'll just... Uh, you know, yeah. when we were uh, talking, you had given me a, a case study to, to read, some homework to do, and I was so fascinated by mm. that case study yeah. that Mondelez did with, uh, with, with the help of Walmart. Mm. 
I had to listen to it twice to just to get the gist of it, and I never understood the, I never thought that the cookie business or the cracker business is going to be so complicated. I would love for you to tell that story to everybody as to how the, how yeah. you have used uh, data to get more insights, uh, you know, for, uh, with, with, with Walmart. Absolutely. Uh, so at Mondelez, as uh, Anurag mentioned, you know, we use a lot of data to get a better understanding of our brands, for example. So the case study Anurag referenced is about Reese crackers. <laughs> you know, hopefully you have that. some of that at home as well. So one thing is a Walmart as a main, biggest uh, retailer in the world is still right on um, maybe after Amazon uh, to these days. But I think they they actually last year launched this very powerful tool called Luminate. You know, they, we are actually now asked to move away from the retail link to Luminate as well. So our Mondelez customer team worked with the Walmart Luminate data team. They tried to find out the Walmart shoppers, you know, who are buying Ritz crackers. Um, so get try to get a better understanding you know first uh, why they buy them <laughs> the buy race crackers and how they consume them and what type of uh, what uh, type of uh, pack types you know all, all this you know you have a family size you have single serve you have all, all these pack types so what why do they choose that certain pack types so with the warm illuminated data we get a very good understanding Basically, people choose different pack types in the store, which, by the way, is a very competitive category for uh, for for cracker, you know. And uh, competing the 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 store's shelf space is 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 very it's a battle basically, you know, because Walmart try to keep uh, as as few as possible, and we try to have that shelf space to tell our brand story, right? So we basically use the data to quantify why we need all these different pack types in the Walmart store and online, right? Because they all serve a very different consumer needs, right? Uh, so we also learned, you know, consumer using Ritz crackers, not just for the sna snacking piece. They also use for at-home entertainment, during, especially during holiday, right? And some of these very neat uh, insights we uncovered, like people actually love question Ritz crackers, right? Mix it with like uh, the butter, the cheese, so they can create this crunchy topping when they make casserole. So these are all very insightful needs and can spark a lot of Ritz cracker related recipes. With you. So we had a lot of fun with that for sure. Yeah. yeah, I had a lot of fun. I had to listen twice. I'm like, wow, I got to go back <laughs> and look at it. So, so now moving from data to Gen AI, you know, how are you using it in the company and where do you think you know, it's going to go at that, uh, you know, the projects you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, for CBG companies, Gen AI, you know, we're just starting testing the water a little bit, I'd say. Um, but however, you know, Mondelez definitely we are at the forefront of that innovation. Actually, two weeks ago at the Cagney event in Florida, our CEO, Dirk, and the CFO, Luca, shared two slides, which is, you know, a big deal for us, right, about generative AI, how we use, at Mondelez, use general AI for marketing, right? So we are certainly uh, find it's a very promising space to be in. Uh, so for us, specific, personally, I think, uh, uh, and also for Mondelez in general, you know, there's uh, two roles. Uh, we believe AI can, generative AI can, can uh, help us to unlock some new opportunity. You know, the first one is really revolutionize the consumer experience, right? Now think about, imagine the, uh, AI system can generate, you know, your personalized product recommendation, marketing copy, but also potentially, you know, the uh, packaging, you know, packaging design, which is really based on your uh, each individual's uh, preference or your taste, right? So that mass uh, customization is going to be really revolutionize the experience because it can help us to, to drive more engaged consumer or shopper, but also enhance brand uh, uh, loyalty as well, right? But of course, at this stage of AI, we still need a human intervention, I believe, to vet the AI output, you know? So that is one area we see. But uh, the other space, and we actually have a case study I can share as well, is about content. So generative AI is going to create uh, 
high quality, and we already see that high quality, highly engaging content as well, right? From the, I think the product description, product copies, uh, the basic ones, but all the way to advertising copy, right? So um, that is going to help us to really cut down the cost, the one thing, but also, you know, helps us keep the consistency and the relevancy of the brand messaging as well, yeah. One case study I want to share uh, with all of you is we launched a Gen AI campaign uh, just at the end of last year. Um, I, I want to call it a Gen AI campaign. It's a user Gen AI technology. It's a Cadbury campaign, you know, Cadbury chocolate campaign. It's called My Birthday Song. So the idea about uh, the campaign is really we wanted to personalize your birthday celebration. So instead of using this traditional happy birthday song, right? We encourage in, uh, the friends and families who want to celebrate their uh, loved ones for the birthday celebration, go create your personalized uh, um, birthday song by sharing a few that person's treats or shared memories with family and friends. Then utilize the generative AI uh, tool to create AI generated lyrics, music, and vocals for your personalized birthday song. So that is a cool idea. It's really celebrate the uniqueness of you the being the birthday person and with some really, really fun feature. But it's also actually cost effective as well, you put it that way. No? And speaks to the brand uh, personality, you know, because Cadbury is all about big moments of generosity to celebration as well, you know. So that's a good example. But in nutshell, yeah, we are very excited about this space and we are definitely leaning in, yeah. No, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I am, I'm just looking forward to more and more fun things coming from the chocolate world. Now, we, yeah. <laughs> when you look at a lot of people who work with you, and that's mm -hmm. the question we asked uh, our, mm -hmm. our expert at All Allstate also, mm -hmm. this is an area where the skill set is not even, you know, we don't know how mm -hmm. um, things are changing at such a fast, fast yeah. sp pace. How do you keep up with it, and how do you make sure your staff has it? Yeah, for sure. Um, so first of all, I think uh, that's kind of my personal philosophy, but we also adv uh, advocate in the company as well, in the, in the world uh, you know, uh, we are in, and in the future generation is that being a lifelong learner is, is, a, is a mandatory thing, basically, right? It's a, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, a so you, that's, that's the way it needs to be in the world that you're living in, you know. So have that learning mindset is very important. I, in, at Mondelez, we, I think the company, we do a good, as a company, we do a good job in terms of upscaling our workforce, you know. So, for example, my team, you know, I run e-commerce business for the company, and, but not everybody is knows how e-commerce works. It's very, people are very good selling, uh, you know, selling grocery, selling snacks at, to the physical store, but not everyone has a knowledge about operating e-com business. So, for example, we need we actually launched a enterprise-wide upskilling initiative to teach everybody the basics of e-commerce 101. And we keep refreshing the course as well. In the mean, meantime, in order to make this course uh, more accessible to everybody, we have all different formats of those upskilling initiatives. For example, we have podcasts, we have three minutes video, we have, you know, and the webinars. So that's a major initiative we do at Mondelez to upskill our uh, employees, you know, in this new world, whether it's e-commerce, everybody need to know how to run the e-com business, right? Because it's not just the e-com team's role. Supply chain needs to know how to uh, put the goods in the e-commerce shop as well, right? But also, you know, generative AI, same thing. We have massive uh, upskilling initiative about Gen AI, and we have, uh, thankfully, there's a lot of free course also we can export. And we partner with uh, partners like Accenture as about our partner uh, in, to bring those knowledge in, that's expertise in as well to the organization to share with others. But net net, I think uh, being a lifelong learner is, uh, is mandatory <laughs> in the world we're living in, yeah. We're almost running out of time. Let me just ask one last question. You know, you mentioned uh, a lot about the different okay. countries and the e-commerce. Why hasn't why hasn't anybody figured out grocery yet? I'm just always curious about it. Yeah. Any any insight on that? Yeah, 
Uh, I think it's definitely evolving. As a matter of fact, I joined Mondelez during the peak of pandemic, <laughs> July 2020. And that is because I saw the opportunity. This is a time if, you know, maybe this is going to revolutionize the grocery business. E-commerce grocery was doubled, uh, more than doubled, tripled at least for Mondelez in some of the countries like in, you know, in those years. I think it's a habit of forming. Yeah, so click and collect is one of these fulfillment model deliver, and the last mile delivery is another fulfillment. Those are kind of is continue to evolutionize, uh, revolutionize uh, the grocery e-commerce space. You know, still very small percentage, but it's getting bigger and bigger every year. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Just, I think we all learned something new today. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll catch up yeah. soon. Thank you.